Do you think they recognize that this is unhealthy, but do it anyway? Yeah, we know that. We know that because they've been interviewed and they say, they've said, a number of them, we, we are sort of agnostic about consumer well-being and consumer welfare. We don't really, we're not trying to hurt people, but also it's not our primary aim. Our primary aim is to ensure that you spend as many minutes of the day on the screen as possible. And if you do that, we'll consider it a success. Your devices, your phones, we've come to depend on them, and yet we struggle. We know there are negative impacts of spending too much time engaged with those screens. Today, three brilliant thinkers talk about the relationships we have with those devices. Adam Alter, the author of The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. Amishi Jha, author of Peak Mind, Find Your Focus, Own Your Attention. Nir Ayal, author of Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life share their thoughts on why we are so addicted to these devices and how we can begin to put that relationship back in balance. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Junk, the official headband of Spartan Pros. Junk produces the best headband, guaranteed to work as hard as you do. Visit junkbrands.com slash Spartan for 10% off your order. Is your phone so close at hand that it could practically be an implant? Can you teach us how to get off our devices? I can try. I can give you some ideas. Yeah, I mean, but that, that's basically what you dug into. You, you, you looked into this uh, world of devices. And, you know, I assume you, get, you got on this podcast because, you know, I'm really passionate about getting people healthy, getting them off the couch, getting them off this fucking device. I'm addicted to it, too. First thing in the morning, I go right to I don't even know why I'm looking at it. I think I'm just trying to avoid my workout. So what would you, what'd you figure out? Is, is there some is it a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. I, I think one question to ask yourself, a good beginning litmus test question is, for how much of the day can you reach your phone without moving your feet? And about 80% of adults say that they can reach their phones without moving their feet 24 hours a day, which basically means that for all intents and purposes, for function, it's basically an implant. It's a part of your body, just like your limbs, just like your head, your brain. And so if you let anything follow you around 24 hours a day, it's going to have an outsized effect on your experience of the world. And when it's a device that's designed to be as sticky, as difficult to resist as a phone, as a smartphone, you're in a lot of trouble to begin with. And so the first thing is really just distance yourself from the device. You just gave me an idea. You and I could start a business. We should, we should um, create like a drone phone and it always <laughs> runs away and you have to chase it everywhere. Would that work? There's a, there's a great alarm clock called a clocky, which does that. It's a little clock alarm clock on wheels. And it, as, as soon as the alarm goes off, it runs around your bedroom and you have to chase it. So it gets you out of the bed. I think we could do something similar with a phone. Put a little a couple of little wheels on the, the front and back of the phone and then it rolls away when you when you try to use it. So what's the problem? Like what, what it's, it's, it's addictive. It, you don't have to walk uh, to get it right. You just go down and start typing on it. And so you're not moving all day. And then you lose all this free time we used to have. I mean, there are so many different problems with it. It's hard to know even where to begin. I think for kids in particular, when you are face to face with a real person and you interact with that person, you learn a lot about how, what it means to be a social being in the world. Like you pick up different subtle differences in facial expressions. Um, you learn the difference between anger and sadness. You, you learn, you take another kid's toy, you get bopped on the head. You, you need those experiences to learn how to live in the world. And when everything's mediated through a screen, everything's distant, feedback's slower, you don't actually look people in the eyes. I think there are a lot of problems that just come from being remote in that sense. But, but even beyond that, if you do something that takes up six hours a day, seven days a week, 42 hours a week, blow that up to the lifespan, we're talking about 15 or 20 years of our lives. We're, this, is, this is, I'll give you a snapshot of 20 years of my life. This is it. And think about what that means, especially for young kids. But for adults too, I mean, it's, it has this colossal effect on how much productivity we're going to have, how easy it is for us to go outside and exercise, how easy it is for us to interact with other people. It just gets in the way of absolutely everything. So a lot of what you lose is, is what you could be doing with that time otherwise. What these phones, what the, the app developers have, have learned is that when you feed people information from within their own echo chamber, it makes them, first of all, it makes them angrier. And anger is one of the most galvanizing emotions. It gets people to keep doing what they're doing. So if I'm looking at Facebook and I'm getting angry because my side's arguments are being displayed and I'm like, right on, that's terrible. I need to, like, we all need to coalesce and be angry about this issue. I'm going to stay on for longer. If you start feeding people information from the other side, 
it turns them away. They, they're either in disgust or just because they don't want to engage, they just say, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to move on with my day. So while that's great for you, and I think it's worthwhile, I think exposing people to all sides of all arguments is worthwhile. It's valuable in all sorts of different respects. It, it goes against the very reasons these companies exist. And so that's a big part of the problem. Got it. And, and um, do you think in Silicon Valley, do you think the folks that are uh, doing this analysis, I mean, basically this is food, right? You're selling food, like you just said, you want more time on the phone if you're one of those execs. Do you think they recognize that this is unhealthy, but do it anyway? Yeah, we know that. We know that because they've been interviewed and they say, they've said, a number of them, we, we are sort of agnostic about consumer well-being and consumer welfare. We don't really, we're not trying to hurt people, but also it's not our primary aim. Our primary aim is to ensure that you spend as many minutes of the day on the screen as possible. And if you do that, we'll consider it a success. So if we introduce a new feature and that gets an extra 10 minutes out of you every day, that's a success. If we introduce a feature and it makes you happier, we don't really care about that as much. As long as you're spending time on the screen, that's, that's our main motivation. And they've been quite candid about it, some of them. Others have been more cagey about it, but certainly that's, that's what they care about because they're getting advertising dollars based on how much time people spend on the screen. Do we know if, if, if they're ch the children of the execs are on phones or not? Like, like, while my wife's still in the kitchen, you gotta hear this. Sorry. Whatever the answer is, I'm rolling the dice. I don't know yeah. what he's gonna say. Yeah. Um, the executives, the people in the know at these companies in Silicon Valley, are their children using devices or not? There's a great article in the New York Times about six years ago that explored that question. And they basically found that a lot of the Silicon Valley tech execs don't let their kids near phones or near their products. The other classic example was an interview with, with Steve Jobs just before he died. It was 2010, 2011. He just released the iPad. And um, the product had been on the market for about three months. It was selling very well. And the journalist said to him, so your kids must love the iPad. And Jobs said, we don't let them use it. We don't let them have the iPad at home which is surprising because he'd been up on stage publicly saying, this is a great device. You should have it. Your kids should have it. It's great for education. It's great for entertainment. And then he was very candid about not letting his kids use the device, which is it's bizarre. It's, it's like a drug dealer saying my kids shouldn't take these drugs, but the rest of the population should. I was envisioning if you and I worked, uh, God forbid, for Philip Morris and we were pushing cigarettes, but uh, nobody in our house smoked, right? Exactly. It's the same idea. And it's so inconsistent with how business usually works. It, it's just hard to live in this world today, to travel, to communicate, to engage with all sorts of different organizations that are central to our lives without a screen of some sort. So the, you can't go cold turkey in the way you can with substance abuse. And that's, that's tough, I think. So the question is, how do we extract the best and leave the worst behind? Part of it is about establishing the right habits. So I know that one of the big problems for me is if I use, if I use this device before bed, it's going to be hard for me to sleep. So what I try to do is to stop using it about an hour before bed. That's important for me. Also in the morning when I wake up, I try for the first half an hour or so not to check my emails. Because once I do that, the day's begun and it just ramps up from there. Um, other thing I do is at dinner time, I try my very best. We have a little box in the kitchen. Um, I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, so they don't have phones yet. But I want to sit at the table with them, with my wife, and actually interact. And so we do our very best to remove the screens that we can, put them in that box. So these kinds of habits, like no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I will not have dinner with a screen. That's an important habit and a rule. And if you can establish enough of those, you set boundaries that mean that you get the best from these devices at the times that make sense. And they don't encroach on your well-being in times when they really should be left behind. And as, an, as a runner, I, I don't run with screens. I have a, I'll have a watch that will track my pace and things like that, but I won't use it. I'll basically put either I'll put a little um, cover over the top of it so I can't see it or I'll put it on the setting where all I see is the time. So I know what time it is. Um, and those, those things are important for my well-being. The guard, guard rails, I like that. Yeah. Um, you just stick to them. You need to almost put it on an index card and laminate it and say, Here's, here are the rules of engagement. Kind of yeah. like, like, you know, a lot of times when I sit down at a table and you take your phone out and put it on, everybody puts their phones on the table, right? I envision, I always go back to the 1800s. We used to do that with guns. Right? We had our gun, but there were rules of engagement with a gun, right? You didn't, you didn't point it at people. <laughs> I, think, I think that gets at the heart of the issue here, right? These pieces of tech are really new. We haven't had them around for long enough to have developed a kind of 
set of cultural norms about what works and what doesn't, we're still working it out. So whereas with something like guns, where they've been around for long enough for us to know there are, there are ways to be safe with them, there are ways to be polite and so on, that doesn't exist yet for screens. And so there's no real digital hygiene. Dr. Amishi Jha talks about how we can build and strengthen our mind to create a better relationship with these devices. I don't know how long it ta- how long does it take for somebody to change their brain. I mean, I know what it takes to build a bicep. I've been working on it forever. <laughs> how long does it take to to build a brain? Well, what we're finding is that about four to eight weeks is the sweet spot to begin daily practices with mindfulness meditation training. And when we've tried to crunch it to be more time efficient, something like two weeks, and this was a project we did with uh, special operations forces, it was too, even for that elite group, it was too short of a time window. So around four weeks tends to be the right amount of time where they're devoting something like 12 to 15 minutes a day to engaging in mindfulness exercises. So 12 to 15 minutes a day is less time you'd have to spend on you know, your body, right? That's not a, it's not a big ask. Four weeks yeah. is... I mean, it sounds like a layup. Everybody should be doing this. Attention is the fuel for our success. We need it in order to think, really make decisions, deliberate problem spaces, uh, learn. So it's important for cognitive functioning, but it's also important for our ability to feel and regulate our emotion. So even experiencing joyful moments in your life requires your attention. So thinking, feeling, and then connecting. So our ability to empathize with other people, to take other people's perspectives, lead others. All of those require attention. And attention happens to be a system that is extremely powerful, but quite vulnerable. So what we see is when we offer people these practices, they're essentially regaining those capacities that tend to become depleted uh, because of demanding circumstances in their lives. And that tends to make all the difference so that they're up-leveling the ability to think clearly and sharply manage their emotions better and, and connect with other people and lead them uh, well. If you think about attention as focus, uh, the thing we notice in people that practice these techniques is not that they, they necessarily focus better, meaning that they can just decide to put their attention on a particular kind of content and then keep it there. It's that they become more aware of when they're not focused. So they come back with more regularity, more consistency, and more fully Um, even if they do end up getting distracted and going off task just as much as the rest of us. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as well. When you say, you know, does it make you sort of superhuman? In some sense, it definitely deviates from sort of standard human vulnerabilities. You end up cultivating these qualities that are so important, yet not, not available to us as frequently or as on demand as we'd like. In this world we're in, my kids are, are victims to this. Like, The devices, I mean, my son this morning, I drove him to school and he's looking at his phone and I'm, and I'm terrible too, but I'm like, Hey buddy, come on, uh, pay attention here. So in this world, people are actually going in the wrong direction. Is that, is that, am I, am I seeing this correctly? Well, you know, I would say just like any, any complex thing, there's good and there's bad, right? So the question becomes, um, why are we engaging with our phones excessively? Like, why is it, why does it feel inappropriate to us? Oftentimes, and you know, I ask my, my kids are, are teenagers as well. Um, the challenge isn't that, it's not that they don't know this is problematic. And oftentimes they too want to break up with their phone, but somehow can't, right? It's like a challenge to actually do the thing that they know is right. And I wanted to just say that that is not actually a fault of their brain or our brains it's the natural way the brain is developed. So I think that, and the reason I say that is because over the course of human evolution, we des- we developed an attention system that is so tuned to enticing, fear-inducing, interesting, um, sort of the, the sex, drugs, rock and roll version of, of, of stimulation in the environment. It draws us in, it was important for our survival. Now we've got a device that that delivers that to us, not just with regularity and all the time, but that it's particularly catered to us. And it's not just one or two software engineers doing this. It's teams of engineers that are perfecting this. So we're up against a lot. And if we start saying, well, it's just me, it's my failure that won't allow me to stop scrolling on TikTok for hours, that's the wrong direction to go. So I actually don't advise people to break up with their phone. I think that it's not 
uh, possible in this day and age, nor would it really benefit us. But what we can do is use these same types of training tools to become more aware moment by moment of how we're using our attention, how we're paying attention. And then all of a sudden, you start slowing down all the entire process. You notice the urge to pick up the phone. You notice that, oh, I'm now holding it. I'm, I'm, I'm let into my phone. I'm noticing myself clicking on the app. I'm on, you know, I'm on, I'm scrolling. Usually we're already in 20, 30, 40 minutes and we're like, what have I been doing with my day? So being more granular and allowing ourselves to know where our mind is moment by moment advantages us and opens up all these decision points so we can say, is this really serving me right now? You know, I got five minutes to talk to my dad. Is that a better use of my time or actually looking at yet another video or yet another post? And then if we ask ourselves that question, we can make choices that actually advantage us more and more often. So it's not a counter, it's, it's almost a counterintuitive approach, uh, not about the device itself or even our relationship to the device. It's our relationship to our mind. And it's the good news is it'll advantage us not only for our interactions with technology, but our interactions with other people too. I think that we are now in a position where we cannot leave it to companies that um, benefit from selling this precious commodity of our attention. We're going to have to demand it as uh, the product for their applications. And, you know, it could be as simple as every time instead of allowing for the scroll that is a seamless act, if it actually required a click. And in that click, it says you've spent X amount of time on this program. So be neutral regarding the content because it could be very important content that could actually benefit you. But just that feedback that says, this is what you've been doing, right? It's what we call meta-awareness. It's, it's, it's an external stimulation that provides us with insight into the content and processes in our own mind, in our own behavior. Then we can make a different choice if we choose to. We'll be right back to this interview, but first a little bit from today's sponsor, Junk Headbands. Their headbands are the official headband of Spartan Pros. They produce a headband guaranteed to work just as hard as you do to keep the sweat and the mud out of your eyes. They are UPF 50 sun protection, they're made in the USA, they're easy to clean, and they won't fade. So wear the headband of the Spartan Pros. Go to junkbrands.com slash Spartan to save 10% off your order. Joe DeSena and Colonel Nye interviewed Nir Ayal when he and his daughter were on the road and had just completed a Spartan race. Here's what he said about being indistractable. Basically, this interview is going to help you get unhooked from devices or, if you're a business, figure out how to hook people, hopefully for, for good. Or how to stop getting distracted, right, from anything. I mean, this, this is actually a really important point because we should define what distraction is. There's this model in the book that I think is really important to define that, you know, the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Now, both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull, and both words, traction and distraction, end in the same five letters, action. Reminding us, this isn't stuff that happens to us, it's actions that we take. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want in life, and distraction, the opposite, is anything that pulls you away. So my goal is not to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you technology is good or bad or whatever. It's up to you. What I want to help you do is to live out your values and to stop getting distracted from the things that take you away from living the life you want. It's really on brand for us, right, Colonel Nye? Because because we talk about action. Uh, I'm sorry. We want people I'm, to take action. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. What? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was looking you were, over. You were I, I was looking over. No, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm I saying we, we push people to take action, but it's the kind of action you take that's yeah. important. Right? It, it, it's it's being positive, t taking the positive steps, right? Do that. And there there are systems in place that we can use. These are called pre-commitments. So enlisting in a, in a system, in an environment that keeps you on task is a pre-commitment. This is one of the oldest tactics there is. I mean, Homer talked about this in the Odyssey 2,500 years ago. But that's really the last step, right? In, in using a, what's called a pre-commitment or a pact is the last step. There are these other steps that we need to take first because the fact is most of us have so much freedom we don't know what to do with it. Kierkegaard said that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. And what we are experiencing today is so much freedom. Endless articles to read on our phone, endless videos to watch, games to play. There's so much choice today that we are dizzy with this anxiety of not knowing what to do, which means that we often turn to distraction. And you're worried you're going to do the wrong thing. You're not keeping up. You don't have, you're not reading the right article because everybody else is going to talk about that article. Or they're going to send you something you don't have the right 
information. My dad used to say, because he would sell things, right? He was always selling. He said, if you give people too much choice, they can't make a decision. That's right. Right. And that's kind of the age we live in now where we have so much choice. The, the, the funny thing is, it's not a knowledge gap that many of us think that if we only knew what to do, we would do it. Right. That's what the self-help industry relies upon. I'll sell you a book that tells you what you don't know. But we know what to do, right? We know we want to go to the gym. We know we want to eat right. We know we want to get closer to our family, to our friends. If we want to be great at our jobs, we got to do the work, especially the hard stuff. The question isn't that we don't know what to do. It's why don't we do the things we know we should do? That's the core of distraction. Is it, is it distraction that keeps, let's say, um, I, I happen to be one of those people that wakes up every morning and I, I do the work, I, I take the cold shower, I, I try to eat right, um, but most people don't. And, and He always looks over here when he says it. No, 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 no. <laughs> and, and our job at Spartan is to get those people to do it. Yeah. Is it distraction that's keeping them from doing it, or is it... Desire. Well, no, they have the desire. It, isn't it like... Um, what is it? And I'll you're tell saying you, yeah, I'll tell you what it is. Yeah. So we talked about traction, things yeah. that move you towards what you want with yeah. intent. The opposite of traction is distraction. Now, two things move us towards traction or distraction, and those are external triggers and internal triggers. Right. External triggers are these pings, dings, rings, all of these things in our environment right. that tell us what to do with some piece of information, right? Your phone ringing, a Facebook notification, the television, your kids, all of these are external triggers. These can move us towards good behaviors, right? Your alarm clock going off at 5.30 telling you to hit the gym, that's moving you towards traction. But if you're with your child and your phone rings and you're talking on the phone doing business when your kid is there to play with you and you're trying to spend some quality time, that's a distraction. So those are external triggers. But the more pernicious form of triggers are the internal triggers. You see, Joe, the reason we do everything, everything we do, it's not about pleasure and pain. Most people subscribe to Freud's pleasure principle that we do things to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Mm -mm. It's not carrots and sticks. Turns out that all behavior, all human behavior is motivated by one thing, the desire to escape discomfort. And so we need to realize this fact that even the pursuit of pleasure, even the pursuit of something that feels good is itself psychologically destabilizing, right? Wanting, craving, these feelings are uncomfortable. Right. So what this means is if all behavior desire to escape discomfort, what that means is that time management is pain management. And this is why people do or do not do what they say they're going to do because they don't have the proper tools to deal with so, the psychological so, discomfort. So the difference between, let's say uh, we're standing outside a hotel uh, for people listening. Let's say uh, two rooms there. I'm in one room and the person that doesn't wake up at 6 a.m. is in the other room. We, you're saying we both, which makes sense, the, we're animals, and at the end of the day, we want to we wanna avoid discomfort, right? Uh, avoid pain. 6 a.m., we both want to avoid pain. Going to the gym, I guess, would be painful, right? Uh, one person decides to stay in their bed because it's more comfortable in the bed. For me, it's more painful to stay in the bed. Exactly. Is that, exactly. Is that the difference? That's a big. That's exactly right. That's right. exactly right. So, but that first step needs to be to figure out how to either deal with the source of the discomfort, or learn tactics to cope with it. So, what you've done that that person in the other room hasn't done, is that you've learned to play the fitness. You've learned how to make it something that you actually want to do, and it becomes uncomfortable not to do, and that's a that's a skill we can learn. You're talking traction, so the mental image I'm getting is actually moving down a track, you know, a tire moving. So kind of putting the two things together is the speed. So Joe is, is moving, his traction is at 70 miles an hour, where I may be comfortable still getting traction at 55 miles an hour. Yeah. Right? I mean, so do I have to do what Joe is doing to achieve the same level of either comfort or not discomfort. So th this, is, this is a really important point, that it's not my job or I think or anybody's job to tell you what your value should be. What I want people to do is to spend their time according to their values. The problem is most of us don't live out our values. And the part of the reason we don't do that, and this is step two, first step is to master the internal triggers. The second step is to make time for traction. Do you know two-thirds of Americans don't keep a calendar? How can we say that something is a distraction <laughs> if we don't know what it distracted you from? My wife yells at me all the time. For what? <laughs> For not checking the calendar. <laughs> and I say, I have it all right up here. She rolls her eyes. Okay. So the, here's why it's so important to, to, to keep what's called a time box calendar. Because 
distraction tricks us, right? We think that by answering that phone call or checking that email, we're doing something productive. It feels worky, right? We're getting things done. But if that's not what you plan to do with your time, it's just as much of a distraction as playing a video game or watching some stupid video on YouTube. It's about planning ahead with intent what is traction and what is distraction for you to make sure you live out your values hack back the external triggers. We know that these products, the, the habit forming products that I wrote about in my first book, okay. they are designed to hack your attention, right? We all know yeah. that Facebook's business model, Instagram's business model, the news is business model, all of these companies hack your attention. That's what they're in business to do. But that doesn't mean we can't hack back. We're not helpless. And so there are these different environments that we can change so that we're not constantly bombarded by all these external triggers. Uh, it turns out that two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings. Okay, did you hear that? Two thirds of people never take 10 minutes to change the notification setting. And yet we complain, we're so distracted, we can't get anything done. Well, did you adjust the settings to use your phone properly? But that's only one of eight settings. When we think about how we're bombarded. I, I'm, I'm one of those idiots. I, I, I don't even know what a notification setting is. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> read, read the book. There's, you there's, get like a ding or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's notified you. It, right. it'll, take you, it'll take you all of you know, maybe an hour to have a completely indistractable phone. You'll save countless hours of distraction because Got of it. it. So it doesn't make noise is what you're saying. Well, so that we only allow us to use these tools on our schedule, not on somebody else's schedule. There's nothing wrong with it. So I have time in my schedule for social media. It's right. in my calendar. So I've turned something that used to be a distraction that I used to use when I was with my daughter, when I was in a business meeting. Now I turned it from distraction into traction because I've planned when I want to use it. And I'm not constantly getting distracted by my phone with all these pings and dings. I wrote this book for me. I have very poor self-control. I wrote the book because I needed help. That's what, and, and I made every mistake with the book in the book with my daughter with uh, my business I, that I, I couldn't focus and none of this is your fault none of this is your fault but you know what it is your responsibility oh, I like that because it's not going away yeah. it's, we're not going to die you know, it's not, we're, it's, Facebook is not going anywhere <laughs> right email is not yeah. going anywhere we have to do something about it we got to do something about it Thanks for listening to this classic episode of Spartan Up Podcast. We want you to drive yourself to success every day, but we know many of you are taking on new challenges, especially at this time of the year. And without the right mindset, it's easy to let those new challenges, those new promises fall by the wayside. Stick with us. Subscribe to the podcast. Listen to Spartan Up. We're here three days a week to motivate you, to inspire you, to bring you new techniques. We are your virtual partner in resilience here to stand at your side as you take on new challenges. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Junk, the official headband of Spartan Pros. Junk produces the best headband, guaranteed to work as hard as you do. Visit junkbrands.com Spartan for 10% off your order.